Welcome to another episode of We Don't Die, where my goal is to give you evidence that although our bodies will disappear, we survive physical death. I'm your host, Sandra Champlain, author of the international best-selling book called We Don't Die, A Skeptic's Discovery of Life After Death. Today on our show, we have Linda Sheldlin Fell. Linda was our guest just two years ago on episode number 12. Now here, we're on episode 109, and Linda has accomplished quite a bit in the past two years, including becoming an award-winning and international best-selling author and creating the five-star book series called Grief Diaries. So far to date, there are 15 books, including stories by more than 350 writers. Her latest book, Grief Diaries, Hello from Heaven contains fascinating true stories about after-death communication and the power of love. Now, that's precisely why I asked her to be back on this show today. Considered a pioneer in the field of inspirational hope in the aftermath of loss, Linda has a passion for producing trailblazing projects that create a legacy of help, healing, and hope. She has interviewed Dr. Martin Luther King's daughter, Trayvon Martin's mother, sisters of the late Nicole Brown Simpson, Pastor Todd Burpo of the book Heaven is for Real, CNN commentator Dr. Ken Druck, and other societal newsmakers on finding healing and hope in the aftermath of life's challenges and loss. For more information on Linda, you can go to her website, lindafell.com or griefdiaries.com or simply go to wedontdieradio.com and click on episode 109. Linda Sheldlin Fell, welcome back to We Don't Die Radio. And thank you so much, Sandra. It's, it's wonderful to be here two years later. That's crazy. Isn't that crazy? I thought, wow, it couldn't have been that long, but... Yeah, from episode 12 to 109, we both have done so much. And I've been so inspired by all the things you've done. Oh, um, thank you so much. Really, That's truly. Kind. Um, for our listeners that are just meeting you, though, not everyone has been back to episode 12, and they probably will after listening to this. Would you give us a little bit about your story, how, who you are, and how you ended up getting into the world of grief and books and such? Well, truth be told, I wanted to be a doctor when I grew up, (laughs) and a brain surgeon to be exact. And, you know, life has a way of taking you down different paths, and that was me. I went down a different path than I intended, and I became a mother. And, you know, truth be told, that's the very best journey ever. I, being a mom is wonderful. Four kids. Now I'm a grandmother. It doesn't get any better. Life was grand. And in 2007, I had a terrible dream. Now, dreams are something that runs in my family. And they're, you know, those dreams, the premonition kind. And in the dream, I was in a car. I was in the front seat sitting I was a passenger and my sister Stacy was driving behind her was my teenage daughter our third born a third born Allie I, Allie was at the time of the dream she was 13 and she was a very gifted athlete competitive swimmer practiced year round two hours in the morning before school, two hours after school, straight A student, just really driven. And her goal was to swim in the Olympics. And come freshman year in high school, she had broke three school records. She qualified for state. She earned her letterman's jacket. I mean, she was really well on her way. But in the stream, the car flew off the road and landed in a lake. And my sister and I managed to escape the sinking car. We came to the surface, but I couldn't find Allie. And I was searching the muddy water. It was awful. I still, that dream is very vivid in my mind to this day. And I couldn't find her, couldn't find her. This horrible, horrible feeling in, in, in my belly, my heart, my whole being. And 
where she disappeared, there was a book floating face down on the water. That was the only evidence she left behind. And I woke up from that dream, and the symbol of the book was lost on me for many years because all I thought about was, oh, my gosh, that dream. And it shook me up so much that I actually sought out a psychic medium to calm my fears and to her, you know, she she's a wonderful, wonderful lady. And she said, no, this, I, you know, I, this is what I see, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but no, Allie isn't going to die. And, you know, in hindsight, the universe protected her from seeing that because had I been told that, yes, my dream would come true, I, I would have quit living right then and there. Sure. And, uh, and so two years later, Allie was 15. And she and a handful of senior swimmers had traveled to Seattle to watch Michael Phelps compete in the U.S. Open. And it was an Olympic qualifying meet. And so they went down there so she could see, uh, you know, Michael Phelps. And this was her own dream to compete in the Olympics. And on the way home, they, she was in the back seat and they missed a stop sign. They had been up 18 hours, it was late, it was dark, and the driver didn't know the road very well, and it was a known dangerous intersection where prior fatalities had happened and they hadn't yet fixed it, and a father coming home from work in his work truck T-boned the car my daughter was in, Mm. and it hit her, and she died instantly, and I was given a phone call that there had been an accident, so I hopped. Actually, I was already in our truck waiting for the kids to arrive at the pool parking lot and uh, so I could, you know, bring Allie home, and I got a phone call that uh, there had been an accident, and I assumed it was a fender bender, and I got on the road and headed down there, and long story short, I arrived at the scene, and I immediately knew my daughter was there. And I got out of the truck with all those people. The road was closed, but somehow they knew who I was. And I found my daughter strapped to a backboard with a white sheet draped over her. And she was on the ground next to the crash. And so I got to sit there with her. And I knew enough not to pull the sheet back. I, I just didn't want that to be my final memory of her yes. and uh, cause she, you know, d- died of blunt head trauma and, uh, and, and other things. And, and, uh, but I found her hand underneath the white sheet and I held it and I just sat there. I don't know how long I sat there for, but, uh, I, I held it. And then I looked up into the field, the dark field, uh, because the impact had pushed the both vehicles off the road into this farmer's field. And I looked up and I saw my beloved grandmother. I had seen her every day of my life and, uh, she had passed 13 years prior and, uh, she was, taking Allie. She had her arm around Allie and Allie was looking back at me and I nodded to her and I said, it's okay to go lovey. I love you. And off they went. And of course, from that point forward, I don't remember much. I was thrust into a fog uh, for two and a half years. I I just don't remember much. And uh, just when I was starting to kind of, the fog was thinning a little bit. My, I was finding my footing uh, some days And my husband, 46 years old, suffered a terrible stroke. The the grief, he kept the grief inside of him. And uh, the perfect storm arrived on June 4th, 2012. And suddenly he couldn't speak at all. He lost his reading, writing, and was paralyzed on his right side. So I was started this whole new journey of grief, whole new different kind of grief. Mm -hmm. And back into the fog. Autopilot resumed its place at the helm of my my vessel. And uh, long story short, I found that helping other people in need was a really great way to help heal my own heart. It made me feel good to hug others who didn't have the support that I was blessed with. And one thing led to another, and I started a radio show. 
and invited my dear friend Andy Cartwright, Cartwright, uh, the founder of National Grief Awareness Day, to be my uh, you know co-host, and that led to other things. And last year, after doing a convention, I thought, what are we going to do with all these wonderful st- stories? I, and I started Grief Diaries, and uh, we published eight books last December, and it's grown from there, and it just keeps growing. It's a snowball that's really beautiful. It's filled with people's stories about, you know, how they weathered their own loss. And at the end of the book, you know, I, I ask them, what was your definition? What's your definition of hope? And what's your silver lining? Because there's a silver lining in everything, including loss. And that's what the books are about. It's people's stories. It's their life. It's how they have gone on their own journey. And it's been really incredible. And that's where we are today. Wow. It's, Linda, it's amazing. The, it's awesome. I, I own a couple of them on Kindle. What are some of the titles of your grief diaries that are Well, the published? first the first eight books that we published last December uh, were about death. They were lost by suicide, loss of a child, loss of a sibling, loss of a parent, loss of a loved one, you know, like aunts, uncles, stepmothers, because mm-hmm. uh, loss comes in many forms. There's also loss of health. We That one was included. But those books were about specific kinds of losses. And now... We are branching out into other forms of grief. Grief comes in many forms, loss of a house, loss of a marriage, uh, you know, different kinds of losses. And the one that we're releasing on Friday of this week is uh, living with an eating disorder because that is a different kind of grief. And so some of the, the new books are focusing on other kinds of life experiences. And most people don't think an eating disorder is a type of grief. But, you know, myself, I'm a binge eater. And so I share very candidly in that book about my own journey through, you know, hiding and the shame and the self-loathing that goes along with that. And that's different. That's a type of grief. And uh, yeah, and so it's been really, really cool. People have said, well, you do this book. Well, you do that book. And so we've really branched out into many different types of life experiences that create heartache but the the you know crux of it is is that the books are all about comfort people who walk that same journey find comfort by knowing others have survived the same storm and that's what it's all about oh and you use the word survived and that's so important because it, it's not rising above it's not healing i mean it really is a survival thing um well, yeah, yeah, you know, some people talk about, about, you know, going to thrive. Well, some of us have thrived. Yeah. I can't speak for everybody. Some people are still in that that gray area of, of surviving, but they have survived nonetheless. Many of the writers have gone on to thrive, mm-hmm. and I'm one of them. Yes, I've weathered two terrible, you know, heartbreaks in my life, but... I've gone through the storm and the sun has come out again. Am I over the loss? You don't get over a loss. It becomes part of you, becomes part of the tapestry of your life. And my daughter's with me every day. And, you know, it brings me great comfort when she leaves me a sign or does place a little funny trick on someone in the family. And that brings me great comfort. Does it soothe the pain of losing her in terms of the physical body? No, it does not. But it does bring tremendous comfort. And because of that, the the sun is out most days. Now, we're coming up on the anniversary of the accident, August 5th. It'll be seven years. And, you know, I'm going to be right back there in that great crevice of pain. But I'll also know that I will honor the emotions that I weather that day knowing the sun will come out again in a few days and i hang on to that i know that now you know back in the early days of a loss you don't know it's survivable because it doesn't feel survivable but it is and life can be good again and my life is different than what i envisioned but nonetheless there's many moments of joy and happiness and that's what i want other people to know yeah amen to that there certainly are and you know i'm a thriver now too But it's been six years since my dad passed away. And even though I am got this big radio show with the book and helping 
gosh, I don't even know, hundreds of thousands of people, I would guess. Yep. Yep. And none of that could have happened without dad going the way he did. So I think there's a bigger part to it. I believe dad is my silent partner in this operation. Yep. Yep. <laughs> like, all that stuff is good. But when we grieve, you know, we do go into that fog and we, we are going to miss the physical human being. I mean, there's just no way around that. You no. know, it's just part of it. That's part of being human. It's part of it. But, you know, that's you, you touched on it briefly there. It is a, there is a bigger picture. And when Allie, when, when I sat with her in the field that night, I instinctively knew there was a bigger picture at play. And I've always trusted that. I, I didn't sit there and think, why me? Now, you know, when the grief hit full force and the shock wore off, there were moments where I felt, I don't like my life. I hate my life right now. I want my old life back. I have those moments because I'm human. Yeah. But I have always trusted that the universe has a bigger picture and it wasn't always all about me there was other people who would be touched by Ali's life or your dad's life or you know there's always that bigger picture and so when i look back on it that dream i had two years before ali dying you know about her dying and and the book floating on the water where she disappeared it could have been a shoe it could have been a hairbrush but it was a book and so that tells me that the universe knew what was to come and was giving me kind of a heads up. Now, did I create a series of books because of that book on the water? No, I didn't put two and two together until, you know, much later. But that comforts me to know that there is a bigger picture, that it wasn't just, I don't believe it was just some bad coincidence, or I don't believe that I did something terrible and deserve such a terrible oh, no. thing. No, I believe no, no. that our loved ones are still part of our, I, I, I call them part of our A-team. You know, your dad's your silent partner, and that's a great way to, to frame it. But, you know, none of this, what you and I are doing and all the other people who are our advocates as well, you know, it's because of our own hardship uh, that we're able to do this and touch the lives of thousands of people we'll never meet. Yeah. And about all those stories that are in your books, yes. it is so much more inspiring to hear someone who had a severe loss and has now survived it or, yeah. or whatever to know I can have that too, as opposed to some guy or girl that just got out of grief counseling school that's never had a loss before, <laughs> you know, no, who are we going to believe? Bless their hearts. They, they yeah, went course. into it, you know, wanting to help people. But this is not a language that can be taught. Grief is, a, is, a, a, is a, an exclusive language. You exclusively, you learn it only by experience. And so you can take all the wonderful, you can get a PhD in grief and still not fully understand it until you walk your own journey. And every journey is unique. But you know what I love about it, that, you know, the, the book that we just released, Grief Diaries, Hello from Heaven, in it, you know, every person who wrote in there has an incredible story. Yes, it starts from loss, right. but they go on such as, you know, one of the writers in that book, Bonnie, she lost her father. And one day she was in town and looked across the street at the, the in front of the post office was a man who looked just like her father and when she looked at him and their eyes met he winked at her and she knew it was her dad and he disappeared behind the post office and she went searching for him and she he she couldn't find him anywhere but she knows it was her dad another writer mary an author in her own right she talks about seeing her mom's eyes in the eyes of a stranger. Wow. And, you know, that's really cool. Really, really cool. So when, you know, you talk about, you know, with you and your own book, We Don't Die, you know, the physical body sheds, but that spirit is alive and well. And my gosh, I have so many more of my own stories. But this book is not just my, you know, it's, it's, it's many people, thousands of people have these experiences. Oh, yeah. Finding Pennies is, of course, a, a classic one that many people um, think of, or a butterfly landing on them and, and then stays on them for a half hour. You know, they think that's her loved one, and it very well could be. We can't, you know, skeptics can't prove that it wasn't. 
And thousands of people have these stories. So it's so cool. Yeah. Can you share some more stories just um, that come to your mind? Because I, I have a picture of the book in front of me right now. And um, I know Christine Duminiak's in there and Mary Lee Robinson and just... Um, you know, the, all the stories, there's 20 of them in the book. Oh, cool. And what's really different about our books, just so your listeners understand, they're not story stacked. We have some really great books on the market. Chicken Soup for the Soul is one that is most people readily yes. are familiar with. Um, those are story stacks where they take stories and just stick them one next to the other to the other to the other. And that's really great. Those are wonderful, wonderful inspirational stories. Grief Diaries is different. I am a interviewer at heart. I love people's stories. So I don't want to just hear the story. I want the I want to know the backstory. So each of the books asks questions of the writers. Oh. And that helps to bring out the deeper story. And so much more comes out when the writers answer the questions. And so each chapter is an answer to the question. And so, for example, I'm going to open it up here. We, we like um, examples because I think a lot of the listeners on this show um, are grieving and all the grief information is helpful. But I want to give some good sink your teeth into <laughs> goosebumpy kind of material that we don't die. You know well, what I mean? You know, okay, so for example, in Hello from Heaven, some of the questions that, that writers were asked to answer was, you know, what was your faith? What did you believe before you got these signs from your loved ones? And And that's a really, really cool question to ask these writers because you know, many people are taught from, you know, a young age through going to a certain church or having been raised with a certain set of beliefs that, you know, when you die, um, this, that, or the other happens. And so when they have their own experience of losing a loved one and then suddenly having this, this, um, you know, the sign that can only come from their loved one, it changes their beliefs that they're, 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 they're forced to, que- to question what they were raised with. And so, you know, one of the questions that asked in the book, and I'm, you can hear me thumbing through it here. Yeah, that's is, okay. You know, the skeptic, what, what, you know, when you share your story, what kind of, what, what do the skeptics say? And also, you know, what was your faith before and how did your experience with your loved one giving you a sign, um, you know, challenge your faith? Uh, you know, does it influence you? I remember one woman, now this isn't in the book, but um, from my own experience, there was one woman who began to rely upon the signs from her loved ones and she wouldn't leave the house unless she got a sign from them that it was okay to leave the house wow. and so her whole life became influenced by people on the other side and so that was a question i asked him does it influence you you know what i wanted to know was you know have you become almost like dependent upon it um some people of course uh, you know, have their experience with their loved ones and they think, and it lifts their heart, right? It lifts their heart and for the rest of the day they're smiling or they're whistling because it lifts their heart that much. But sometimes it can interfere with your life and you start using it to make decisions and such. And so I wanted to know that which ones of them have, have reached that point where it became, you know, such a strong influence they couldn't, you know, decide this, that or the other you know, without it. So I wanted to know that. I wanted to know what was the silver lining that came from it. I wanted to know, did it cause them to seek a a psychic medium? Because in some pockets of population within just our country and then other countries alone, seeing a psychic medium is frowned upon. It's evil. It's a sheep, you know, it's a a wolf disguised as a sheep, uh, this, that, or the other. So I wanted to know, um, you know, what, what, what was your experience? Did you go seek a psychic medium to confirm the sign that you received from your loved one? And so, you know, Grief Diaries Hello from Heaven is not just story stacking. It's, it's going deeper, wanting to know more about that backstory. Did you share it with family and friends? Now, I'm going to give you a couple of my own examples. Okay. 
Um, my son, DJ, is 27 years old, and our daughter, Allie, uh, she loved fairies, and her favorite color was blue. And so she would spray paint rocks, fist-sized rocks. She would spray paint them blue and go put them outside under trees and such for the fairies, okay? Mm-hmm. And, you know, I didn't question it. This is what made her happy. And when you're a parent, you pick and choose your battles. And so I didn't say, oh, honey, don't waste a spray paint or don't do this. Or I just thought if that makes her happy, (laughs) it's a rock, right? And, you know, (laughs) spray paint, I can buy more. And so she did this for a really long time. And every so often, we still find one of her blue rocks somewhere. Well, one day, our 27-year-old son, DJ, was in his truck. He has this big truck, and you can hear it a mile away. And he was doing something running errands. He got out of his truck for two minutes, got back in his truck, and suddenly there was this big lump underneath the floor mat where two minutes before it wasn't there. And he reached down, lifted up the floor mat to think, you know, what is this and how did it get there? And underneath the floor mat was one of Allie's blue rocks. Wow. You know, this happened just a couple of years after the accident. And so we were still in that fog and he loved it. That rock meant the world to him. Okay. And so two minutes before it wasn't there, he jumps out for two minutes and suddenly when he gets back in, there's this big old blue rock sitting underneath this floor mat. That's pretty cool. Yeah. That's pretty hard to explain from a skeptic standpoint, sure. right? And so that's a really cool one. Uh, for me, myself, I mean, we have so many in our family, and it's happened to many people in our family. I belong to a big family. And, you know, my sister, uh, she, for about six months after the accident, she was having all these electrical problems and just all kinds of different funny problems. And, you know, it became kind of a daily thing where someone else in the family said, ah, Allie did this and Allie did that. And it was, you know, it really lifted our hearts. It, it gave us healing that nothing else could and and so it was really cool but one of mine just recently i love playing on my ipad now i put in 12 to 18 hour days seven days a week wow because our snowball has grown that big but you know at eight o'clock at night usually is my done time i've I've been up you know good 12 to 14 hours by then and so i try to always stop what i'm doing at 8 p.m and i sit next to my dear sweet hubby and i play games on my ipad and I love word games, and I often play against my family members. Mm-hmm. And one night I started a new word game, and I was given three tiles. And the three tiles that my little iPad dispensed was A-L-Y, in perfect order. No spaces. It wasn't vertical. It wasn't backwards. It was Alley, A-L-Y, right in a row. Nothing else on my board but those three letters. Aww. And, you know, I, I mean, what are the chances of that? Uh, right. Yeah. And, and so in perfect order, you know, no spaces missing. There it was, the only three tiles on my board. And, you know, so it's things like that that really lift our heart. And it gives me goosebumps looking back on it. And so the book, Hello from Heaven, is filled with those kinds of stories. Now, you know, one woman lost her uh, former fiance to suicide. And one night, I, after she'd done a balloon release in his memory earlier that day and she went to bed and she dreamt that, well, actually, I can't remember what she dreamed, but when she woke up, she heard a voice in her ear and it said, I got my balloon. And, you oh. know, that's, that's really, really cool. So she did this balloon release in memory of her former fiance who died by suicide, went to bed, had a dream, <clears throat> excuse me, and woke up. To these words in her ear, I got my balloon. That's really cool. Yeah. Really cool. And it, it lifted her heart, you know, because she went to bed with a really heavy heart. And, you know, so the, the book has all those kinds of accounts. Now, Christine Duminiak, who co-authored, uh, you know, she's got her own book filled with the same kind of stories. And, you know, this is what you're doing as well. You're reassuring people who've lost someone they love dearly that we don't die. Our spirit is alive and well, and it's all around us. And sometimes it's, it's um, you know, playing jokes or sometimes it's doing something that, uh, you know, just lifts our heart. But that's amazing stuff. Amazing. Yeah. You talk about playing jokes. I had just returned um, from the Arthur Finley College a few weeks back. Uh, I, I share about that on episode 101. And Arthur Finley College is a school to learn to be a medium over in the UK. And I had a... Uh, 
we, you know, we're all working with other people practicing mediumship and, and someone told me that I have a, a jokester around me playing practical <laughs> tricks. And they said something about being my grandmother's brother. Now, his nickname was Joker. Oh, my goodness. Is, isn't that strange? And so right before I had left, because they said, um, whoever I was working with said, you lost something important to you and you have been scrambling trying to find it before the trip. And Linda, I had lost my passport. Oh, my goodness. And so you can just imagine as the days neared going to the UK, not having my passport, I was mental. I mean, I was going crazy. Of course, I booked another appointment with a passport agency, but I didn't want to spend the money to get a passport and stuff. Right. And so I went to bed the night before I found it, and I said, okay, maybe there's a learning to be had here. Maybe there's trusting to be done. Who's ever got my passport, you know, I, I acknowledge you're there, but just please tell me where it is. This is important to me. So I woke, you know, and I'm thinking I'm talking to myself because we always have that skeptical mind that's saying this is crazy. So I woke up in the morning and the voice said, look under the couch. And I'm thinking, why would my passport be under the couch? And I went. And I lifted the cushions and moved the couch apart. And lo and behold, there was my passport. Is that right? Oh, it, my You know, it's, it's a little thing. It kind of pissed me off. But it also yeah. showed me <laughs> that we re retain our sense of humor, right? Mm -hmm. And then yeah. to have this person in the UK tell me about this jokester and my grandmother's brother That's named Joker, cool. who was a practical joker. You know, and yes, can the skeptic in me say, oh, you know, it, it just fell out of my bag and I kicked it under the couch? Well, of course. But, right. You know, we all have the right side of our brain. Who's uh, That's our creative side where I think all these fun things happen. And then the left brain that's saying, I'm going to be a skeptic and it's not real. Well, you know, you know it's, it's okay to question things, but when your mind isn't open, to possibilities that are invisible to us, then you you shut it down before you've given it a chance. And, you know, I'm going to give another really good example of Allie, you know, saying, hey, guys, I'm here. I know what's going on in your life. I'm part of it still. I is a few years ago, my sister, I'm very close with my sister's. There's four of us girls in the family, and then we've got a brother who I also adore and love, and our family is very close. So my oldest sister was having her very first grandbaby. Her, she's only got one daughter, and this was her daughter's very first baby, and you know, very exciting time. And her due date was near my daughter Allie's birthday, and. I thought, oh gosh, you know, that's a day that is always sad to me. That's the day of Allie's birthday. And, you know, I, I, I kind of hope that she doesn't give birth on Allie's birthday. Her, her due date wasn't that day, but it was near that. Well, long story short, she did give birth on Allie's birthday, wow. but it gets better than that. The doctor that walked in to deliver, because you know how you, you're, you're in, in labor, and it's really the nurses who take care of you most of the time. The doctor kind of comes in and out, and then they get the doctor right, you know, at the end to, to, to catch the baby and, and sign the birth certificate and all that really good stuff. And, of course, they, they're, they're credited with much more than just doing that. But long story short, this, uh, this doctor who my niece had never seen before came in. Because she happened to be the one who was on call that shift change, came in to deliver the baby born on Allie's birthday, and her name tag on her hospital jacket said Allie. So Dr. Allie delivered my sister's first ground baby on Allie's birthday. Wow. You know, chances of that doctor being named Allie, a doctor my niece had never met. And and, and it was spelled exactly right. Same spelling, everything. Is that not cool? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, it was Allie's way of saying, hey, I'm still celebrating with you guys. This is, you know, this is awesome. Welcome to the newest cousin in the family. And, you know, so you, that's pretty hard to explain away. What oh, that? just yeah. dri driving home. I left my mom's house a couple hours away this morning and drove home. Uh, to be on our interview today and I was thinking about my dad and I look up in the car in front of me the its license plate was John J-O-H-N 
No same way. Same exact spelling. Oh, my gosh. That's crazy. It's just one of those fun things. You know, it, it is. And so for the skeptics, you know, no amount of convincing is ever going to persuade them, right? And and what do you do with that? Well, there's not a lot you can do with it, but it doesn't mean that we have to be closed-minded because when your mind is open to the idea that, you know, when you are when you die a physical death, you're not really dust, uh, you know, your spirit lives on and it's all around us. And I'm going to tell you something that's even more cool about this is that... Our youngest son was a, he is now going to be 21 here in a few weeks, and he was 13 when his 15-year-old sister died. They were 18 months apart, mm-hmm. and uh, playmates, you know, being that close, they were like t- twins. I had one kid on each hip, right? And so he was just 13 when he lost his sister. And he, Allie was very studious. She, it wasn't enough for her to have 100% in a class. She did extra credit so she could have 105% because her her dream was to go to Stanford and then compete in the Olympics. And so she was always considered the academic one in our family. Well, Sean never tried, never tried. He would come home and say, hey, mom, I got a C on a test. I didn't even study. And I'm like, oh, for Pete's sake, you know, if this child even just cracked a book, He might get an A, you know, and so he would rather be off playing with the boys in the neighborhood kind of thing. Well, after the accident, Allie came to me and told me that Sean was actually smarter than her. And I thought, no way, you know, she was really smart, straight A student. I wasn't a straight A student. My husband wasn't a straight A student, but Allie was. And I thought, no way, Sean, you know, he's happy if he gets a a, a C or a B. Mm -hmm. Well, after the accident, he started applying himself. And he is now uh, going into his junior year of college. And guess what he is majoring in? What? Physics. Oh, he's smart. And he plans to get a PhD. And he's already been admitted into his physics degree and as a sophomore. And one of the things that he plans to do is to study wormholes. He wants to find... You know, Allie is alive and around us. Your dad is alive and around you. So where are they? Mm -hmm. What dimension are they in? They're not up in the sky. They're around us. They are around us. If they can manipulate electricity, if they can put blue rocks underneath floor mats, if they can, you know, do this, that, and the other, then where are they? And so he is studying physics because he hopes to find that missing link between the different dimensions oh, and you know cool, he's, he's 20 years old and he's got a lifetime ahead of him and you know i can hear the skeptic saying right now oh my gosh that, that can't you know that, that that's a waste of time he's he's but you know what tell you what he's a smart kid and that's his goal and you know einstein was not given any credit people thought he was a total loser until he proved a, a newton theory wrong And only then did people say, oh, my gosh. And, you know, the rest is history. So, you know, will Sean succeed? I don't know. That is up to the universe. That's up to, you know, but that's kind of a really cool thing to allow a child to go down that path. You know, we're not going to step in his way and say, oh, buddy, you know, go study you know, nuclear physics or this physics or that physics. Nope. He wants to go find that link between the dimensions. Good and for really him. cool. Yeah, really cool because we know, we know, you know, that blue rocks just don't appear for the size of a fist don't just appear underneath the floorboard. That just doesn't happen. That's not a coincidence. So oh, right. Anyway. Right. Yeah. I had a friend of mine who I forgot how many he he would find dimes in the weirdest locations. Um, and he attributed to, I think, his grandmother. But he actually found a bunch of them in his hotel room uh, bathtub when they really? were there before. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. Yeah, and he's like, I didn't drop them. Nobody's been in the room. I mean, so th- things do happen. And yeah. and I'm so excited for your son because... I, you know, I don't know if you ever expected you'd be in this world of what you're doing. I didn't. I certainly didn't. And I don't mind skeptics because I was one. You were. You were yeah. a skeptic. Yeah. And so. Put you on your path is you wanted 
to you you, you kind of set out almost to prove it wrong and in the process yeah. you proved it right exactly and, you know because i think and, each person wants to have meaning to their life and, and then when you just take the time to look around you and even those of us who have dabbled or read a little bit into like quantum mechanics and realizing everything is energy and and right. and you know you start questioning things and it's gosh when the questions start happening the more digging you do and then just naturally i found myself doing what i'm doing now and i wouldn't trade it in for anything and i'm still digging i mean i i'm on now on this quest with uh mediumship and there's yeah there's physical mediumship that stuff happens you know and they call them yeah. apports yep. things that appear out of thin air uh there's trance mediumship people that speak through um a human being that's in like a hypnotic state in voices and different languages and i you know and my my left brain wants to go come on now you know you're not going to fall for that but my right brain knows that, yeah, there's some con artists out there because there are, but there's also a level of reality to some of the stuff. So I'm going to continue learning and sharing, and, it, and it's fun. Yeah, and, and you know, I'm going to make a confession. Uh, many people don't know this about me because um, this it was something that I, I, I was born with, the gift of mediumship. And it's really hard for me to say that. Because I was raised in an area where it's very conservative. Now, I want to clarify that I'm a Christian and I follow God. I follow Jesus and they are my, they are who I answer to. They're who I follow. But I also know that the universe is a very big place and there is more than meets the eye. And the reason why it was so hard for me to be open about my ability was because I was thrown under the bus by religious people. Yes. And it wasn't until my sister, I was, I was tormented by that thought. There was a time when I thought God must have hated me because I would have all these experiences and, you know, I couldn't control them. And it was terrible. I really felt like I had no one to turn to because this wasn't something that was from God. And so why, if I love God so much, why did he allow me to have these experiences that people said was evil? Mm -hmm. And I couldn't figure that out. And my sister, I'm, I, this, is, this is true story. Ten years ago, I was 40 years old, and the accident hadn't happened yet. but. I was just tormented by the experiences I was having, and I, I just, they were terrible. I, not all of them were terrible, but I was very frightened by them. And my sister took me to a church, and it's a well-loved church here, a very large church. And the pastors there, they said, you are not cursed. You have been given the gift of discernment. And the gift of prophecy. And, the, and so for the first time ever, I was told that was a gift, not a curse. Mm -hmm. And it was a church who was telling me that. And you know what? I burst into tears. And I did some work with them because they have spiritual warfare. And which this is something that is not in every church. And for the first time, I felt like I belonged. A church didn't throw me under the bus. Who knew? And now that I... Because I believe in God and I believe in Jesus I'm, and I'm a Christian, I now understand that not everyone will understand how, that, why God built me this way or built you your way or other people, but he did. And I trust it. And, you know, people say, but it's a, it's a wolf in sheep's clothing. Well, if it can bring comfort to other people, that's not of God or, or the devil. The devil doesn't want comfort to be brought to people. And so that, that can't be evil. And so, you know, it's a real quandary in many pockets of our society that believe that it's, you know, things like mediumship is, is evil. I, and yes, there are con artists because there's con artists in every field. Yes. There's con artists in, a turn, in, in lawyers. 
in in you know doctors in teachers and they're everywhere and of course there's going to be con artists in the field of mediumship but you know the big picture is that most of them are have this really great gift and they use it to help others there is nothing bad about that at all Mm. and and so you know that's really important to know um it's still hard for me to to share that and so right now sharing that with your listeners on this radio show i still kind of have that like oh my gosh you know waiting for someone to throw me under the bus Mm -hmm. yet if i don't be brave then my children won't learn to be brave. And it keeps passing on down through my family. I don't want my grandchildren to live in fear like I did. Mm. And so we have to open that dialogue. We have mm. to be the ones to open that dialogue and make it okay for future generations. Yeah. And, you know, whether it's mediumship or talking about, you know, we don't die, whatever it is, it's up to us to make that change. Yeah. When I first wrote my book, uh, most many people know I have a day job and I'm a chef I work with my mom in a catering company and we work with race car teams so we have a huge tent we can feed on average 800 people a meal and after the book came out one of the race car drivers fathers who knew I had the book showed up at a racetrack with a giant banner that said life after no is life after death real Sandra Champlain says yes and he posted it under the food tent Really? And you talk about fear. I had never told people in my surroundings that I was one of those people looking at life after death stuff. I mean, I panicked. And what happened was not predictable. More people. In fact, nobody came up to me and called me weird. I had people that had lost a child that had seen it. I had people that were fighting um, breast cancer, saw that sign. I had people that have had those weird things that happen, like knowing somebody's name before the phone rings. People started just embracing, like, well, what is this all about? And so I was under this feeling that people would think I was weird, that I'd be outcast. Yeah. And, and, and so it's like, wow. And even now to have... I don't know, 10,000 listeners or however many there are for this radio show, we are like-minded people. There's not going to be anybody here that's going to throw you under the bus. More people than not, I think, have a sense of belief in something. And I urge everybody to find some of the answers within yourself. Just because a church says it's this way or a book says it's this way or even Sandra Champlain or Linda Sheldon Fell says it's this way. Don't believe it. Look inside yourself. Those things that resonate with your soul, that right. make sense to you, use it. If it doesn't, throw it out. Because we're all on our own personal journeys here. And, um, and, and for as many people that say uh, life after death is the devil's work or going after, you know, talking to people, I've also interviewed people that can quote, um, verses of the bible where this is normal like (laughs) contacting disease is not outrageous you know and so yeah even christine duminiak i think has some quotes that she's shared that uh, and she's very very much a christian and uh so yeah she's catholic and I, I actually uh, stayed with her recently when we were in new york city uh she lives outside philadelphia and uh, we were on the Open to Hope TV show, and um, it, 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 she's just a, one of my favorite people ever. And she's a Catholic through and through, and, uh, you know, born and raised Catholic, very strong Catholic. And yet she is an after-death communication expert. Yes. And what's the name of her children's book? Uh, Heaven Talks to Children is one of them. The newest one that she just came out with is Grammy Visits from Heaven. And it's a beautiful, beautifully illustrated uh, book about a child who loves her grandma more than anything. And the grandma dies. And one day, as the little girl is sitting on the swing, her grandma comes and starts pushing her. And I, so it's, I, I'm not going to give you the spoiler, but it's just really beautifully done. And it helps children, you know, who are grieving the loss of a loved one to know that they don't die. And uh, so Chris is just the loveliest of 
souls really a lovely lady and uh, she's got another book out and i'm trying to think the name of it it's not coming readily to mind but um yeah she's you can look her up author christine duminiak d-u-m-i-n-i-a-k and i'm pretty sure most of your listeners are probably familiar with her because she is an after-death communication expert so yes and she was one of the earlier episodes as well um yeah she's a treat she's wonderful well we just have a few minutes left linda Look deep into your soul. Do you have any closing words or something I haven't asked you that I should or just something oh, there? God. You know, that's a tough one because we can talk forever. I know. Still never I cover know. all of it. I just want people to know that when they are in that deep fog of grief, that the sun does come out again. And I want them to hold on to that. I want them to, I, I'll loan them my umbrella. My umbrella is big and strong, and they are not alone on that path of darkness. They are not alone. Death and loss has been around since the beginning of time. And if other people have survived it, why not you? Why not me? And let us be your light until you find the sun once again. But it's survivable, and life can be beautiful again. That's what I want them to know. It's, it's a journey and it changes you, but there are silver linings, and hang on to those until the sun comes out again. That's really important. That's beautiful. And grief diaries can be that umbrella also to hear those stories from the 350 plus authors. 400 now. We're 400. 400. <laughs> yeah, in less than a year. And new titles are being inspired by the people. And anybody can write in the, in the join the book project. Go to griefdiaries.com and click on the blue learn more button. Anybody can share their story. It, it is not just open to professional writers and authors. It's, it's anybody who has a story to share. There's many different titles. And, you know, you can sign up for one. You can sign up for five. Uh, as long as you have walked that journey, you are welcome and invited to share your story. Wow. Because your story is going to touch the hearts of people that you've never met. And that's pretty cool. Yeah. Very cool. And I want to encourage people to do that. When I had a dream of writing a book, all that kept going through my mind is, I'm not an author who wants to hear my story, who's going to believe it, I'm a nobody. And so that's what I call it the voice, you know, our inner critic was shouting to me. And believe it or not, there's been a whole bunch of people that my story has made a difference. And I'm telling you, the listener, if you're feeling like this resonates with you and you want to go to griefdiaries.com and get more info, do it. Because you have no idea who needs to hear exactly what you've been through and it'll make a difference in their life. You know, it does. I often say that every story shared is another heart touched. And the writers will touch the hearts of thousands of people they'll never meet. It's and that's true. what's so cool about it. Yeah, so very true. And lastly, this just came to my picture in my mind. I've interviewed a lot of people who have had near-death experiences, and many of them say that there's this life review, you know, in those final moments uh, when we cross over. And they say, you know, you go through and you see um, the impact you've had on other people's lives. First, the negative stuff. You feel uh, where you've hurt someone or you said something you shouldn't have said, you feel the impact. And that sounds kind of crappy. And so I try to tidy things up right now and make amends. But then they say the next part is you see the difference that you've made in lives and you see the ripple effect. And could you imagine someone reading your story in Grief Diaries and see how their lives have improved and gone on to change and you know it really seen that ripple effect so i just got that view of that and linda for your own life i mean thank you so much for all the difference you've made and especially the difference that you'll never even know about Um, but you have this burning desire and passion to share 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 and make a difference and i i know it your words have made a difference with me and i i know they've made a difference for lots more so thank you for being who you are Oh, thank you, Sandra. And same to you as well. You know, we're on this journey together. And it's such a a humbling 
honoring experience to help other people. I, I mean, really is, is such an amazing, amazing, magical force. Mm-hmm. And it's fun. It's, it, it, it's it, it, fun. It's, and, you know, we are human, so life isn't perfect. It's no. not always idyllic. But, you know, when most of your time is spent helping other people, it really transforms your own life. It takes you outside your own pain and your own hurt, and you realize you're not alone. And there's a lot of healing that happens with that. That's yes. pretty, that's, that's critical to know you're not alone. So, yeah, yeah, so thank you so much. Thank you. And for our listener today, thank you for spending the last hour or so with Linda and I. Uh, I believe it's been of value, and there's always good nuggets i think that come out of these conversations but thank you for giving your time and i hope you're leaving with some inspiration today and that you're looking for signs and talking to your loved ones that might be in that invisible place because we know the internet's all around us and that's invisible and i say heaven is in that same place so again you can check out linda's website at lindafell.com or you can go to griefdiaries.com or simply go to we don't die radio.com and click on episode 109 and I can have I have links to all the things that Linda was talking about today. So, in closing, my name is Sandra Champlain. I've been your host on We Don't Die Radio and I do believe that life is an education for the soul and that your life here on earth is important. So, thank you for listening and we'll see you soon. <music>